first 95% of our time on Earth, humans built no settlements. We were mostly nomadic and would follow the food and water. When we learned to grow our own crops, we started to put down roots, literally, and suddenly settling made sense. So across the globe, we began clearing trees, carving out enormous quarries, and building villages, towns, and cities as fast as we could. But not all of them have survived. Some towns grew around a particular resource, like the gold mining town of Bodie in California. When the gold ran out, so did the people, leaving a perfectly preserved snapshot of the Wild West and a lot of brothels. In other cases, a disaster triggered the mass exodus of people, like in Centralia, Pennsylvania. This town decided to burn landfill waste and accidentally set fire to a cold seam. The fires raged underground and created sinkholes that emitted deadly amounts of carbon monoxide. This was discovered when a 12-year-old boy fell into one. Luckily, though, he was pulled to safety and the entire town was evacuated. The underground fires, they still burn today. 60 years later. Other settlements weren't really abandoned, but only ever managed to attract a small number of residents, leaving them eerily empty. The most famous examples are Ordos, the ghost city of China, and Burj al Babas, the Turkish town of over 500 identical Disney like castles. But not including Ordos, these examples are all towns or villages, a relatively small investment to abandon. In rare cases, entire cities have been left deserted, lost to war, natural hazards, or even submerged under the sea, like Alexandria. Or real-life Atlantis. However, relatively few are still standing for visitors to explore, with silent streets, buildings left frozen in time, and occasionally a creepy doll left discarded in the dust. Agdam in Azerbaijan is one such city. Founded in the 18th century and granted city status in 1828, Agdam was once home to 30,000 residents. It thrived during the Soviet period, producing butter, wine, silk, and hardware. But when the first Nagorno-Karabakh war broke out in 1988 between the Armenians of the region and the Republic of Azerbaijan, the city became a battleground. Initially, it was used by Azerbaijani forces as a base to attack Karabakh. They launched BM-21 Grad rockets and bombing raids from the city, killing both enemy troops and Armenian citizens. Armenia retaliated by shelling the city indiscriminately, destroying many of the buildings and seizing control in July of 1993. The civilian population was evacuated or forcibly relocated, and Agdam became part of a buffer zone, remaining uninhabited to this day. Remarkably, their professional football club, Karabakh Agdam, continue in exile, playing most of their matches in nearby Baku and becoming the most successful Azerbaijani team to ever compete in the European Championships. They even made it to the fourth round of the 2010 UEFA League, despite having no home grounds. To prevent Azerbaijan from ever returning and retaking the city, the troops continued to shell and bomb and do whatever they could to destroy what remained. This included the Bread Museum, taken out by an Armenian Grad missile in August 1992. While a Bread Museum might not sound like the greatest loss or the most thrilling day out, it did contain a few notable pieces, including a 150-gram piece of carbonized bread donated by a Russian survivor of the Leningrad blockade. She had saved it and somehow avoided eating it, even on the verge of starvation. Unfortunately, along with bread from the Russian cosmonaut camp and thousands of grain samples, it was never recovered. All buildings left standing were dismantled and scavenged for construction material to be used in Stepanakert, the capital city of Nagorno-Karabakh. This includes the Agdam Mosque, which was stripped bare and left roofless. When Andrei Galafiev visited in 2007 to photograph the destruction, he found a herd of cattle had moved in and the floor was thick with manure. This, of course, sparked outrage and cleaning and refurbishment began to preserve Muslim cultural heritage in the area. Today, the city is a sprawling sea of the remaining carcasses of buildings without windows, roofs, or any valuable metals. It's littered with mines and it's off limit to visitors, apart from those brave enough to bribe taxi drivers and sneak in. However, it won't remain like this for long. In 2020, a ceasefire was agreed and Agdam was returned to the control of Azerbaijan. Authorities say over a hundred billion dollars worth of damage was done and removing the mines will take 15 years. Despite this, they're hopeful that they can make the majority of the city habitable again within three to five years, enabling displaced citizens to return. They even plan to make the rebuilt Agdam better than before. In 2021, Azerbaijan's president, Ilham Aliyev, visited the site to lay the foundation stones of a school, museum, residential building, and a park, and presented an ambitious plan to merge eight nearby villages, with Agdam creating a smart, green city of 100,000 people.
Not all ghost stories were lost to war. In 1970, the city of Pripyat was built in Ukraine to house the workers, elite scientists, and engineers of the Chernobyl nuclear power station. It was constructed just three kilometers away from the plant and was home to around 49,000 people, mostly young families. The average age was just 25 years old. Tragedy struck on the 26th of April 1986 during a test to see how much power was needed to keep the number four reactor functioning during a blackout. Negligence and a lack of safety measures led to the reactor overheating resulting in a steam explosion that caused huge quantities of radioactive material to be expelled into the air as the fire raged over nine days that followed. The disaster released 500 times the amount of radioactivity as the Hiroshima bomb and the city was declared unsuitable for human habitation for the next 24,000 years. For 36 hours after the explosion, officials dithered unsure whether or not to order an evacuation. All the while, radioactive particles rained down on the residents and their children. Some reported headaches, metallic tastes, coughing and vomiting, but others were completely unaware and continued gardening, playing in the streets, and even hosting a wedding. When the order was finally given on the 27th of April, the residents of Pripyat had just 50 minutes' notice to gather their belongings and attempt to board one of the evacuation buses which had been drafted in from across the country. The queue of buses was 20 kilometers long, but the residents were calm and sensible, and the evacuation was completed within a few hours. If only the buses had been called 36 hours earlier. Debate still rages about the number of deaths that resulted from the disaster. 30 died in the initial explosion, and radiation poisoning killed many more. The numbers became blurred when the USSR, fearing bad press, banned radiation from being given as a cause of death. The World Health Organization estimates the civilian death toll to be around 4,000, but this doesn't include the members of the Soviet military who were drafted in to help with the cleanup. So the true figure is likely a lot higher. The radioactive particles also traveled around the world, and some studies have estimated that the Chernobyl disaster has been responsible for almost one million premature cancer deaths. Today, the exclusion zone covers a thousand square miles, but radiation levels are low enough for most people to enter Pripyat for short periods, with a visit exposing them to less radiation than a transatlantic flight. Ex-residents travel there to pay their respects to the graves of their loved ones or to see what's left of their old homes. Sadly, thieves strip the city of anything of value soon after the disaster. Tourists also venture into Pripyat and bring back photos of a city frozen in time, with family portraits yellowing on the walls, toys left to decay on the floor, and an eerie ferris wheel rusting in the forest. The only residents now are the wildlife that retook the city once the humans left. Despite the radiation, brown bears, wolves, lynxes, and moose have thrived. Initially, animals in the area were born with mutations and deformities, but survival of the fittest means that they died quickly, and the creatures there today appear largely unaffected and thrilled to be living without humans. Another example of a human-free city is the lost city of Petra in Jordan. Established by the Nabataeans as a trading post, it was initially situated between Amman, Damascus, and the Red Sea, making it an ideal hub for commerce in the area. Essentially, in the middle of a harsh desert, the site should never have been able to support a city. But the Nabataeans were clever, and they created their own oasis. They made the most of what little water there was and installed a system of dams, underground systems, and conduits that could harvest and store rainwater for the dry months, and rock-cut channels and underground pipes were employed to harness any natural springs. They also embraced the mountainous terrain as an excellent defense against the Greeks and employed rock-cut architecture to carve impressive buildings directly into the cliff faces. At its peak, the city housed over 20,000 residents who found wealth and security. Trade was booming, and Nabataeans were even able to charge travelers a toll for crossing the territory. However, their success wouldn't last. As the Roman Empire expanded into the Middle East, they took over the city. Initially, they invested heavily, building new roads lined with massive columns. But trade began to drift north, and ships took over from the difficult job of transportation through the desert. Petra's importance as a trade center was declining fast, but the final blow came when the 363 AD Galilee earthquake struck, destroying many of the buildings and crippling the water system. The city was largely abandoned, with just a few Bedouins remaining in the caves. They feared any more outsiders could finish off the destruction of the city, so they endeavored to keep its location a secret, and the city became lost, but not abandoned, for hundreds of years. However, in 1812, Swiss traveler Johann Ludwig Burkhardt heard rumors about the dead city. He became obsessed with finding it, and disguised himself as a Bedouin, procuring his own goat. His story was that he intended to sacrifice it at the prophet Aaron's tomb, said to be located in Petra. So, local directed into the city, exposing it once again to the west. 
From then on, numerous archaeologists arrive to work in the city and uncover its secrets. Even now, we only have access to 15% of it. The rest remains hidden underground. In 1985, the Jordanian government decided to begin the UNESCO World Heritage Site designation process and forcibly remove the Bedouins, leaving the city abandoned. But that doesn't mean it's been left alone. In 2007, it was declared one of the seven wonders of the world and has been a backdrop for several films, including Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen, and The Mummy Returns. Unfortunately, unlike Pripyat, the animals haven't thrived in Petra. Wildlife is stifled by tourism, and animal rights group Peter has threatened to intervene. The camels used to carry visitors have been abused, they're whipped and beaten, and in one case, they were seen working with open, fly-infested wounds. Over one million tourists visit each year, and the Bedouins now live in houses constructed nearby, earning money by offering tours and selling Indiana Jones souvenirs. I imagine the city's fate wasn't quite what the Napateans envisaged when painstakingly carving their oasis. Just as an earthquake finished off Petra, natural disasters are a common theme in city abandonment. Pompeii was an ancient Roman city near Naples in Italy. It was built on a lava plateau caused by a previous eruption of Mount Vesuvius, and it was home to around 20,000 people. Tragically, in 79 AD, it erupted again 1,800 years after all memory of it being a volcano had been forgotten. The eruption began with 18 hours of pumice rain that gave most of the residents a chance to escape. Around 1,150 remained in the city. Whether they didn't understand the threat of the volcano and chose to stay indefinitely, or just thought they'd have more time to flee, we'll never know. But early the next day, their time ran out as the pyroclastic flows began. These are enormous clouds of burning ash that can travel up to 62 miles an hour. They can destroy structures and simultaneously suffocate and incinerate any living thing they engulf. Devastatingly for the people of Pompeii, the prevailing winds normally blowing from the southwest would have taken the flow away from them. But on that day, they were blowing from the northwest and directed the searing cloud straight at them and their city. The space was short-lived, and by the end of the second day, the eruption was over. No one who'd chosen to stay behind survived, as the pyroclastic flows had reached temperatures of at least 2,500 degrees Celsius. Anyone caught in it was cooked instantly. Their bodies and what remained of their homes were then buried in ash up to six meters deep. Soon afterwards, survivors and thieves arrived to salvage what they could, even taking marble statues from the forum. In the centuries that followed, more eruptions buried the city even more deeply, and it was largely forgotten. In 1592, it was almost rediscovered when architect Domingo Fontana was digging in an underground aquifer and ran into the surviving walls and foundations. However, he didn't report his findings, and Pompeii remained hidden for another century. Excavation didn't fully begin until 1748, but even then it was poorly planned, irresponsible, and often carried out by untrained diggers, and progress was often slow and damaging. In 1860, Italian archaeologist Giuseppe Fiorelli finally took over and employed a much more careful approach. He also noted that many of the voids found in the ash contained human remains, concluding that the hollows were left after the bodies had decomposed. He developed a technique to cast the bodies by pouring cement into them and clearing the ash once set. This led to the incredible and often chilling recreation of the exact positions of the victims when they were hit with a pyroclastic flow. A dog contorted in agony, a mother attempting to shield her child, and a small boy cowering, covering his nose with both hands. Much of the residents' daily lives was preserved. Archaeologists found food in their ovens, financial records on wax tablets, and vast amounts of ancient graffiti, including Florianus, privileged soldier of the Seventh Legion, was here. The women did not know of his presence. Only six women came to know, too few, for such a stallion. The gladiator barracks read, she, I hope your hemorrhoids rub together so much that they hurt worse than when they ever have before. In the Basilica, we two dear men, friends wherever were here. If you want to know our names, they are Gaius and Aulus. Certainly a bit more eloquent than Simon was here. Not all cases of city abandonment have been caused by events as dramatic as war, nuclear explosions, or natural disasters. Sometimes the reason for desertion is simple economics. Hashima Islands, also known as Battleship Island for its shape, was established as a coal mining facility back in 1887, and it was bought a few years later in 1890 by Mitsubishi. They constructed four main mine shafts and spent almost 100 years extracting 15.7 million tons of coal, contributing massively to Japan's industrialization. By 1961, Mitsubishi built a mine 
miner's apartment block on the island out of reinforced concrete to withstand potential typhoons. It made history as Japan's first large-scale reinforced concrete building. They continued construction on the island, aiming to provide everything the miners and their families would need, including a school, a kindergarten, hospital, cinema, shops, and a bathhouse where waters would turn black as the miners washed. The facilities almost made up for the stifling conditions in the mines, which reached up to 30 degrees Celsius and 95% humidity, but not quite. At its peak, the island was home to over 5,000 people, making it the most densely populated place on Earth at the time. The buildings took over, and eventually everything was concrete. It became known for its lack of vegetation, and some nicknamed it Midori Nishima Shima, the island without green. Work was claustrophobic, particularly for the moles, who were the ones sent deep into the mine to dig and break up the coal. Things turned darker in the 1930s when Mitsubishi began using conscripted Korean civilians and Chinese prisoners of war as forced laborers. 37,900 worked there at some point under horrific conditions. The work was backbreaking. They were fed little and beaten if they slacked. Those who tried to flee drowned during the 18-kilometer swim back to the mainland. The VAR practice continued up until the end of the Second World War, by which time over 1,300 of the workers had died from various underground accidents, exhaustion, and malnutrition. In the 1960s, petroleum began replacing coal in Japan, and the need for mines declined. Mitsubishi officially closed the shafts in January 1974, and the island was abandoned by April. Although the families planned their departure, the city still took on that eerie, deserted, prippet feeling. Chalk writing remains on boards in the classroom. Kids' shoes lie discarded in pathways, and the hospital floor is littered with x-rays of the miners' lungs. The island is now officially part of Nagasaki City and opened for tourists in 2009 when it also applied to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Initially, the proposal was opposed by both South Korea and China due to the past use of forced labor on the island. However, Japan offered to ensure the facility both recognized and honored those lost and held captive, and each country withdrew their objections. It became a World Heritage Site in 2015 and has also appeared in several films, notably James Bond's Skyfall. Since then, 500,000 tourists have traveled to the island to take in the 1970s time capsule. Only one thing has really changed. Nature has begun to reclaim Hashima, and the island is no longer without green.